because here's the truth. In spite of what men would say, there aren't nine ways or a hundred ways or five ways or four ways or two ways to God. There's only one way. One way. I started praying this morning about daylight respecting this message and this service. I will say some things tonight. They will go out over television a little later that may seem harsh, things that I know will not win me friends. That will almost isolate me. I realize that. And I take no credit for bravery. I think not of myself as a martyr, and yet I know that of what I feel that God has given me, and I must say will strike fire. It will cause anger. But yet in my heart of hearts, I know I have no alternative or choice. I will say it with love, with all the tenderness and compassion, and to be honest with you, that is the reason that I will say these things tonight is because of love. When God reached down in a forsaken world, in a land called Ur of the Chaldees, and touched an idol-worshipping man by the name of Abram, a Gentile, from whose loins would come Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all that we know and hold dear today. God told him, get thee out of this land and go thee to a land that I will show thee. It's always been that way. It's never changed. It's the same today. When God called you, he called you out of something to something. You're in the world, but not of it. Never forget it. It's not a popular stand. Never has been, never shall be. When Abram got to a place called Bethel, Bethel, which means house God, Beth, house, El, God in the Hebrew, house of God, he built an altar. It seemed like that Abraham was always building altars. He went down to Egypt, got into trouble, came back, built another altar. Then the scripture plainly says, Strangely enough, the Holy Spirit had him to go to a mountain, a hill, midway between Bethel, the house of God, and a heathenistic city called Ai. That town, Ai, means rubbish heap. It's the place where that Joshua had his problem with Achan and the sin and the Babylonian garments and the wedge of gold and the pieces of silver that he stole from Jericho. And God finally gave victory to Ai. But it means a rubbish heap. Ai is directly eastward of Bethel. And somewhere in between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, that rubbish heap, God directed Abram to build an altar. Now, this altar was not a sin offering. It was a whole burnt offering, which was different. When Abraham would build these altars, in essence, he was telling God in these whole burnt offerings, as the animal was totally consumed, Abram was telling God, I have no plans of my own. 
I have no future of my own. I have nothing of my own. I am totally, wholeheartedly, completely, absolutely dedicated to thee, heart, mind, soul, spirit, and body, come what may. That's what he was saying. That hasn't changed either. God demands the same identical thing from you and I. The same thing. Every single solitary child of God, irrespective of church affiliation, is situated somewhere between Bethel, the house of God, and Ai, that rubbish heap. That's where the conflict ensues. That's where the battle takes place. That's where Satan is going to do all within hell's power with the tentacles of darkness to reach out and pull you back to that garbage dump. He'll use every tantalizing, hypnotizing power of darkness, young people, to entice, to ensnare, to mesmerize you and pull you back. It glitters, it shines, it's bright, it's brilliant to get you back to that garbage dump. God's pulling you toward Bethel, the house of God. He's pulling you with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason you're here tonight. That's the reason you're watching me by television right now. Some of you watching me, you're fighting a battle in your spirit. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go. You, there's a turmoil going on inside of you. Satan is pulling here, and God is moving upon you with everything he has. And you are caught in the middle. And it's your decision, sir. You can go to the garbage dump. You can go to that rubbish heap. Or you can go to the house of God. It's up to you. You're situated in between. All right. I want to show you how, it's, how it has worked down through the ages. It's a scenario that has never changed. The payoff is the soul of man. The payoff is that eternal commodity that belongs to God and he gave to you and me. That Satan wants more than he wants anything else and he will offer you anything for it, your soul. It go ways, goes way back to the time that God looked down to a world that had sunk so deep into sin. It had gone so deep into utter, absolute filth and wickedness and corruption until God knew there was no saving it. Now, re now remember this. When you think of august, almighty God, that created the heavens and the earth, and he cannot save a world. That means that world, that antediluvian age, the time of Noah's day was so rotten and so despicable that it would defy all description. It was so corrupted that it was at the point of total, absolute destruction, and that is Satan's plan to utterly, absolutely destroy. All right. There was no alternative or choice for God but to immerse this filth in a sea and an ocean of water, the flood. Now, those of you, some of you that watch me today may be sitting back in your chair and saying, well, I don't like that. I don't understand nor enjoy nor appreciate a God with such unfathomable power, illimitable power, august power. Just because he has the power to do it that will come down and totally, absolutely wipe off the face of the earth every living soul save Noah and his family. I don't like that. 
Others of you might look at me and say, Jimmy Swaggart, God is a God of love. And I cannot reconcile the two. I cannot reconcile a God of love that you preachers talk about, that you say this Bible portrays as doing such a thing as that, not to speak of a place called hell, not to speak of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I want to say some things to you right now about that. Satan has been very successful in getting the church of the living God to believe that the God of love, and he is a God of love, for the same God that drowned the world in water also sent his Son to die for mankind. For God so loved the world. But to understand God, you not only have to love what God loves, but you have to hate what God hates. Now, I want to make it clear. I believe I can say without fear of contradiction before man or God. I believe there is in my heart a love for every human being on the face of the earth, be they Christian, Muslim, be they Buddhist, be they communist, be they atheist, infidel, or agnostic, be they sane or sinner. I believe there is in my heart a love that, that causes me to go, that, that causes me to weep, that causes me to reach out. I believe it's in you. I believe it's in these that are here. But love will never embrace that which is diametrically opposed to the plan of God or the revealed will of God. Now remember that. I love all people, but I do not love all things that people do. I love all mankind, but I do not love error or wrongdoing or evil or wickedness. And one of the blights of the church of the living God today and one of the blights of the pulpit is uh, that preachers or churches or denominations or fellowships or movements uh, not only preach the love of God and thank God for that, but they seem to be afraid to proclaim that which God also hates. Not popular. Doesn't sit well. All right now. Jesus in Matthew, I think it's 13 and I believe it's 13 and 33, said something that is easily written over, read over, skipped over. It's only a verse. It's a parable, but it's a verse. He said, the kingdom of God is like a woman that takes leaven and puts it in three measures of meal, puts it in the measures of meal until the whole is corrupted. That's all he said. Now that's strange. He first used the term kingdom of God. We basically understand what that is. Then he used the term woman, and in this sense it means evil. A woman represents many things in Scripture. It represents Israel at times. It represents purity and virtue and righteousness at times. But when it's used in that sense that Jesus used it at that moment, it represents evil. Leaven is that which corrupts and rots. And he said she puts the leaven in the hole until it's all corrupted. Every bit of it is corrupted. What was he talking about? He said the whole kingdom of heaven is corrupted. Well, that's strange. What he's saying is this, that, the, that Satan with all the powers of darkness has sought to infiltrate Christianity until 
pure doctrine, pure religion undefiled becomes watered down, corrupted, erroneous doctrine. Little by little, man's doctrines is inserted with God's doctrines. Little by little, error and wrongdoing becomes a part of the kingdom of heaven until the whole thing becomes rotten. That's what he was talking about. Does that mean he's opposed to the church? No, 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 no. Does that mean, Jimmy Swagger, that you are opposed to churches? God forbid. We're building an 8,000-seat auditorium in Baton Rouge for a church. I'm a member of a particular fellowship that I love and respect. I said a moment ago that the church is the foundation of the work of God on earth. However, for every good church where souls are saved and the gospel is preached behind pulpits and lives are changed, totally changed by the power of God. There are a hundred churches uh, that carry the name of Christian and Christ uh, but carry it in name only. All right, what do I do as a preacher of the gospel? What do I do? What do I do when I see men going to hell that think they're going to heaven? I don't mean one or two. I mean millions. And I say nothing. They had a hurricane in Louisiana some years ago. It was so ferocious that it, it, the waters rolled and it, 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 the, the Homochitta River built up to such a raging tor torrent it rolled aside and swept away the bridge on Highway 61 coming out of Natchez, Mississippi down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It was raining so hard that night, quite a number of automobiles, the man, the woman, whomever driving, trying to find their way through that slashing rain, nobody told them the bridge was out. And car after car went over the edge of that precipice. They never found one car or one body swept away until finally a man stood in the middle of the road with a lantern waving him down saying, don't go any further. The bridge is out. What kind of man would that be? Were he have held that lantern in his hand? and have watched car after car go off that precipice into the raging torrent below and would have stood back and said, I cannot tell them anything because it will interrupt their trip. That man would be a beast. That man would be less than an animal. There's not a dog that would do such a thing. A dog will, will, will lose his life at times to pull a child from a raging torrent. And I'm a preacher. I'm a voice. I'm crying in a wilderness of this world. And the bridge is out. Millions upon millions upon millions are heading toward a precipice. Millions that are church members. Listen to me. What I say will be blunt, and I've tried to get around saying it, but I can't. Millions of Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Lutherans and that are members of churches. And you get angry with me because I call the name that are members that, that have their name on church rolls that are religious, that are a part and parcel of that religious activity, but millions upon millions of them have never been born again, but yet they think they're saved. They think they're saved because they've joined a church. 
A preacher has stood behind a pulpit and in thousands of these churches that I've mentioned, these people by the millions have never heard a gospel message, have never seen an altar call, have never seen someone weep their way through to salvation, have never seen the power of God, their lives. Somebody said, how do you know they aren't saved? How do you know? How can you be sure? Jesus said you can judge a tree by the fruit that tree bears. Does that mean that all Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Congregationalists, or whatever that they're... No, 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 a thousand, a million times, no. I'm trying to get a point across. And we're getting Pentecostals now that are members of Pentecostal Assembly of God, Church of God, Foursquare, Pentecostal Holiness Churches that have not been born again. I'm saying that the whole thing, if we're not careful, will be corrupted. Corrupted. Preachers that don't preach the power of God, that don't believe in a holy God, that argue over whether Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that do not believe in the miracles of the Bible, that do not believe in the born-again experience, that do not believe that Jesus is coming soon. Let me tell you people, get out of those churches. 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 Curse me if you may. Revile me if you may. But I'm in the middle of a storm and I'm waving a lantern. And I'm telling you, be religious. Take communion every Sunday in the week. Join the church roll. Shake the preacher's hand. But, mister, until you've had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and been born again, you are not saved. Must, must I speak of my Baptist, my Methodist, my Episcopalian, my Lutheran, my congregational friends and leave out my Catholic friends that I love so much? <laughs> my heart breaks for the Catholics. My heart breaks as I see so many of them reaching out to God. Must I stand idly by while millions think they can do penance and they can take the sacraments and they can kneel or stand before the priest and they can confess their sins to him and they can come away and I know in my heart of hearts, I know in my soul, I know in my spirit that in all of this planet, of the four and four point billion human beings on the face of this earth, there is not one single solitary mediator between God and man except Jesus Christ. Not one but Jesus. Not one but Jesus. Not one but Jesus. Not one but Jesus. I say it with all the compassion I know. I wouldn't hurt your feelings. I would not offend you for anything, but this gospel is an offense. It is an offense. All of the thousands and thousands and thousands of priests that reach out and say, I forgive you. 
And that poor soul that walks away thinking their sins are washed and gone and, and are forgiven, God forbid, but those sins are not washed away and are not forgiven because that priest cannot forgive. He cannot cleanse. He is no mediator between God and man. Let me tell you today, the weakest sinner, the most wickedest man that ever lived that has cursed every breath if you will look up toward God or look down toward God and say, Jesus be merciful to me, a sinner instantly God will hear you, God will cleanse you, and God will wash away every stain and every sin you see, I know this offense I know it. Are we right by saying nothing? How many millions of Catholics and denominational people and Muslims and Buddhists, I don't care who it is, will stand in the judgment and point their fingers to preachers and say, you didn't tell me. No one told me. No one warned me. Nobody gave me a chance. Because here's the truth. In spite of what men would say, there aren't nine ways or a hundred ways or five ways or four ways or two ways to God. There's only one way. One way. And it's not through Mohammed. It's not through Buddha. And it's not through Mr. Moon in New York City. And it's not through anyone else, and God forbid, and I don't say it disparagingly because I think the Pope that the Catholics now have is maybe the sweetest, kindest man they've ever had, but he is not the way to God. There is only one. It is Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm saying has caused wars. What I'm saying has soaked the earth with blood. What I'm saying has caused men to be put on torture racks and their bodies pulled apart. But woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel. Does that mean that I do not love? Does it mean I have no compassion because I tell you the truth? No, I love you. That's why I tell you the truth. I have compassion for you. I weep for you. I cry for you. I pray for you. I say come out of these heathenistic satanic systems that have ignored the Word of God and turned their back on Jesus Christ. And ex I don't care what church you belong. I, I'm not touting some particular church. I am touting, glorifying, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the fairest of 10,000. God buried it all in water, save Noah and his family. And after that flood recited, men decided that they would build a tower that would reach to heaven. It was in the general vicinity of the ancient, aged city of Babylon. Babylon means confusion. It was to become confusion. Some have erroneously thought that men were building a tower as high as they could to escape another flood if God would send one, but that was foolishness. These men didn't have that in mind. When these brilliant intellectuals, and get it out of your mind that those people that lived 4,000 years ago were dumb, brute beasts crawling on their all fours, grunting incoherently. It wasn't true. They were brilliant. They were brilliant. And 
These men built that tower, and there is every evidence that they finished it. And it was a tower that had at the top of it the signs of the zodiac. The astrologers of that day were in effect telling God, we don't want you. As Paul said in chapter 1 of Romans, they worship the creature more than the creator. They built that tower of Babel. Brilliant. And God looked down at that rebellion and that's what it was a man walked up here a moment ago and said brother swear I got my boys rebelling rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and the world rebels against God and God said we won't use fire from heaven or bolts of lightning we will just change their languages And one of them said, would you hand me some brick? And the other one said, polydu face or something like that. <laughs> he said, I don't understand you. <laughs> and that was one more meeting that the union couldn't take care of. And they scattered. All right. You can go there today. You can go there today. And you can, they think they found where that heap is. And it's nothing left. It's just a rubbish heap. And when men forsake God, there's nothing left but a rubbish heap. Now you get my word. The mighty nation of Canada, the mighty nation of the new United States, the source of our strength is God. And if we forget God, we will turn into a rubbish heap. It is the house of God or a garbage dump. It is the house of God or a garbage dump. You'll find nothing but ruins of Babylon and the Tower of Babel. Garbage, rubbish. Take your step further. Achan, Jericho, Ai, sin. Sin will stop the move of God. Sin will destroy a nation or a family or a soul. Achan stole and God withdrew his blessings from Joshua and Joshua hit Ai and 37 men died. Joshua wept before God until the sin was revealed and Achan was, was, was killed, was stoned. Somebody said that's cruel. That's the only way to stop it. That greed and wrath and bitterness and lust and filth in your life, that jealousy, that envy, that malice, unless you get it out, it will eventually get you. Unless you dig it out by the power of Almighty God with God's help, it will destroy you because it's a house of God or a rubbish heap. Joshua had to get it out. Then they had victory at Ai. Let me tell you this. When you stand with your back to Ai, Whenever God gave the design for the temple, that temple was facing the east, gave it to David and Solomon built it. The brazen altar was the first piece of furniture, if you would call it that. It's the only piece that common man had access to. It was a type of Calvary, type of Jesus dying. And then it went on into the brazen labor that the priest washed in. And then inside the holy place to the left was the seven-branch golden candlestick. To the right, the table of shewbread, the bread of the face, 
Then the golden altar with its incense right before the veil of the Holy of Holies. And then inside the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Covenant where God resided between the cherubims. The way God, the Holy Ghost, designed that thing. When you turned your back on Ai, the rubbish heap, you were looking toward the brazen altar that was a type of Jesus and Calvary and a type of the Holy of Holies. But saints, you've got to turn your back on Ai. You've got to turn your back on the rubbish heap. You've got to turn your back on the filth of this world. There's no other way or you'll die. I want to say one other thing before I close this message. Churches that may have all the accoutrements of the world, churches that may have all the sciences of education, churches that may have all the rudiments of intellectual knowledge, but if churches, irrespective of what name may be on their denominational door, if they turn their back upon the Holy Ghost, that church will become a rubbish heap. Mark my word. Paul in Philippians 3 and 8, he said something that Every child of God ought to think about very, very strongly. He said this, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. The King James translators cleaned it up. But Paul actually said, this whole world and everything in it. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I've studied under Gamaliel. I've done it all. But I count it as no more than a manure heap. All of it is nothing that I may win Christ. It's an altar or it's a rubbish heap. You turn your back on the altar, you will stare at the rubbish heap. Abraham was in the middle. Thank God he turned his back on Ai, the rubbish heap, and looked toward Bethel, the house of God. Bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, giver of life. I love you so much. I pray, God, that these simple words we have said, oh, Jesus, will never, never return to you void will never return to you void. I've preached a message that's totally unlike anything I normally preach concerning a Holy Spirit rally. But I have preached that which I felt God wanted me to preach. I'm going to do something a little bit differently today than I've done in a long time. I'm going to give two altar calls. They will be a little bit different. I've sought God earnestly. I've wrestled in my spirit. But I must do what I feel He wants me to do. How many in this audience that word has come to your heart, an altar or a rubbish heap? An altar or a rubbish heap? You're facing it. But which way are you facing? You sense the battle that's taken place in your soul. You fear 
for your soul. The only way you're going to make it is to turn your back on this world and everything in it and look toward that hill called Golgotha and keep your eyes on Jesus and he'll take you through. Civilizations have come and gone and are now rubbish heaps because they defied God. How many in this vast audience this Sunday night would slip up a hand? Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not saved. I'm not living right. And I'm going to go a step further with it. I'm a church member, but I don't know if I am born again or not. Would you pray for me? I will not embarrass you, I promise. But you'd slip up that hand right now on the main floor. How many? Let me see it. There's a hand. There's another. There's another. There's another and another and another. Keep raising them. I see them everywhere. Thank you. To my extreme left in the bleachers, how many of you as I slowly turn would slip up your hand, Jimmy Swaggart? It's an altar or a rubbish heap. It's been put before my heart and my eyes today. I'm not living right. I need prayer. I'm a church member, but I don't know if I'm saved. There's a hand. Keep raising them. Keep raising them. I see them. Thank you. Keep raising them. I see them up there in the top, all the way from the top to the bottom. Thank you. Keep raising them. Keep raising them. I see them. Thank you so much. Way at the back now. How many in those top middle bleachers? Raise your hands quickly. I need prayer, Jimmy Swaggart. I'm not living right. My right hand side. How many will raise your hands? How many? Quickly. Slip them up. I'll see them. I see it, sir. Pray for me. I'm not living right. It's an altar or a rubbish heap. Let me see it. Let me see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now listen carefully to me. I want just those that raised your hands. It's going to take a little courage. It's going to take a little strength, but God will help you. I want those of you that raised your hands, wherever you may be seated in this vast coliseum here tonight in Toronto, Ontario, I want you to stand to your feet. You will feel alone but God will be with you. That's it. Every one of you that raised your hand, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. That's it. That's it. Every mother, every mother's son, every dad and every father's daughter, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. I'm going to make another sweep. God's speaking to some of you. You feel that small voice of the Holy Spirit down deep inside of you saying it's time. I want you to stand. Come on now. Come on now. Oh, God. Thank you. God, love your heart. Just a moment more. That's it. That's it. That's it, sir. That's it. All right, listen to me. As these gracious people are standing all over this Colosseum, I want a Christian loves Jesus. I don't care what church you belong to or whom you may be. I want you to stand beside one of those. You may have to walk a little bit to do it, cross an aisle or whatever, but please feel free to do it. You don't have to put your hands on them if you don't want to. Treat them with all respect, but I want you to stand right beside them. That's it. That's it. Thank God that's it. Do you know what's happening right now, saints? You know what's happening? Right now, some people are saying, God, I'm going to turn my back on the rubbish heap of this world and sin and Satan, the flesh and the devil. And I'm looking toward Bethel, the house of God. That's what's happening now. Now listen carefully to me. Those of you but television, God is speaking to your heart. It wouldn't even hurt you in your home or motel to stand. You don't have to, but it wouldn't hurt you if you did it right now as these have stood here in Toronto. Let me tell each one of you this and listen to Brother Swaggart carefully. God loves every one of you. He loves you so much that he has orchestrated this moment for your eternal soul. The very angels of heaven are watching you right now, this moment. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. Now listen carefully. 
out loud. I want you to repeat it after me. Out loud, I want you to repeat it. And right where you stand, God the Holy Ghost is. And Jesus will come into your heart just like that. As you repeat this and believe it with everything in you. Now bow your heads and pray. And I want everyone that's seated that's a Christian to pray it with these. You don't need it, but it'll give them encouragement and spiritual support. Donnie, step up here, please. Now let us pray. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm so sorry for my sin. And the, life I've lived. and the life I've lived. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me and wash me. Cleanse me, and wash me. With, your own blood. With your own blood. Right now, right now I, turn I turn my back on the world, on the world. And, all and all that it holds. And I turn my face, I turn my face. Toward, Jesus. toward Jesus. With my mouth. According to the book of Romans, chapter 10, I confess Jesus Christ. In my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and he is alive. I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Redeemer. And right now, according to his word, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am redeemed, I am saved. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah to God. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Well, glory to God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing it. I, in just a moment, in just a moment, I'm going to call hundreds of people up here to pray for them to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But before I do that, I want to thank God for the greatest miracle of all. And four flats, please. And I want to sing it. Sing it with us. Thank you, Lord. Jimmy Swaggart, I know that I'm saved. I have no doubt about it. But I have not yet been baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, according to Acts 2.4, where it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And Jimmy Swaggart, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty for that living water. I know I'm saved, but I want the power of the Holy Spirit would you slip up your hand right now? Would you slip up your hand? God love your heart. Now I want you to listen carefully. We're going to be a little crowded, but that won't bother the Holy Spirit. Thomas is going to sing with the girls. And John, there is a river. And as they sing, I want every one of you that raised your hands, I want you to come and stand right up here, stretch out all the way across. You'll have to take them around also. 
Every one of you stand shoulder to shoulder. Don't, don't bunch up, please. Stand right on those lines as you see there. Sing it, please.